Through free speech, ethnic strife, religious disputes, political instability, radicalization, human rights violations, dozens of conflicts around the world at the same time. Censorship, propaganda, corruption, lack of information and hate speeches keep societies divided. The truth and free speech are under pressure. Who knows what's really happening in areas of conflict? Who provides the facts and impartial news to civilians caught up in the dispute? Who makes sure that their stories are told? And who holds their governments accountable? Independent local journalists. They are the main source. But who trains them and shows them how to distinguish facts from fiction? Who teaches them to do their jobs safely and supports them in promoting democratic values in dangerous places? The Institute for War and Peace Reporting, IWPR. We provide local journalists and activists with a voice worldwide, in countries at war, in crisis or transition, such as Syria, Afghanistan, Nigeria and Ukraine. We train with local partners and guide journalists and activists on the ground, men and women, like Tana, Ayolu, Nabil or Malala. We teach them to think critically, report on the basis of facts and give them social media and digital safety training so they can get their stories out. They get special first aid courses, learn to understand the rule of law and the meaning of human rights so that free speech is protected and change can begin. Support IWPR. Any amount is welcome. IWPR. Giving voice. Driving change. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, this evening will all be in English, so I'm, as you know, I'm Dutch, but I will speak English as well, um, so that our guests also can follow it. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you here in the Bali, um, full house, even with this uh, wonderful weather. When I woke up this morning in Moscow, it was four degrees, and I was shivering with cold, so, you know, for me, the shock is, is even bigger. Um, I'm the chairman of uh, IWPR in the Netherlands and a board member of the international board of IWPR. Um, and that's why I have the privilege to welcome you. Um, and also to say just a few words why I uh, helped to start IW, IWPR here in Holland. It's an organization that you know, has been around for quite some time, uh, but never really was quite well known in Holland. In fact, it's an organization that is not really loud, and I'm trying to change that. Um, it's a small organization, but with a huge impact, with a huge amount of projects, and the little film that you saw showed some of them in Syria, in Nigeria, uh, in Ukraine, and Ukraine will be the specific, specific topic of our evening. But as you know, uh, you know, I left Holland uh, uh, almost 30 years ago to start journalism in Russia, actually to, you know, more or less help introduce journalism as we know it in, 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 uh, in Russia. Um, and I've seen the whole cycle from, uh, uh, from a, uh, uh, when I came, there was still censorship, then to, to free media and I helped, you know, create and found uh, newspapers and radio stations and TV stations in Russia. Um, that really could work in an almost absolute freedom of the press. And then now, sort of, you know, the full circle where most of the media that I actually founded are being closed as we speak. And the company that I lead today is also under enormous pressure. We'll talk about that later on. Um, and, you know, I've, uh, you know, seen close hand how important it is that especially local journalists, so, you know, not, you know, correspondents who come from America or Europe or, you know, fly in and stay for a while, but people who live there, who work there, 
can do their job and uh, you know I basically followed our WPR uh, f for a long time and and saw the uh, the projects that they did was always very impressed and when I was asked uh, to help them I, I immediately jumped to that uh, uh, occasion and that's why we are having this evening it's it's not the first evening we do, but we are trying to spread the word. We're trying to make IWPR more well-known uh, in, in Holland uh, and, and in Europe in, in general. Um, and this is one of the evenings f uh, for doing so. And of course, if you are inspired, uh, you know, of course, I hope that you will you know, want to join us. Um, we have uh, uh, the opportunity for people to, you know, help us to give money. And Dido, where's Dido? Is here. here. Dido is here. Can I say sure. Dido found out she made a huge mistake. I made Derek the vice chair. Ah, okay. And he is the chair. Well, that is totally not important. Um, so. Um, <laughs> So as I said, today is about Ukraine and, and the long arm of Russia. So we'll talk about, you know, uh, and it's not only Ukraine, it's actually the countries around Russia. Ukraine, the Baltics, uh, and the Balkan. Um, and we have uh, people uh, uh, working for and with IW, IWPR from all these countries here uh, to tell about their perspective um, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, Jeroen Smith uh, has been so kind to uh, moderate this evening, and we are very happy with that. Jeroen, thank you very much. Uh, but before uh, uh, Jeroen starts, I would like to give the floor to Katja Laba. Uh, she is the project manager of IWPR Ukraine, and she will say a few words to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, dear ladies and gentlemen. This is a great honor for me to speak to such respectable uh, Dutch audience, uh, and especially on the day. This day is important for Ukraine. Uh, the European uh, Parliament has approved our visa-free regime for Ukrainians to travel to the Schengen states. Uh, this was, uh, uh, we believe, great success for Ukraine, and this was a great effort for our government to uh, comply with certain requirements uh, for Ukraine uh, to, to, pro to have certain progress in reforms to get this visa-free regime. Is it comfortable if I speak closer to the microphone? So, uh, over the past 25 years, IWPR works in uh, countries of conflict, transition countries, and uh, uh, countries uh, which has uh, closed societies, restricted societies. And Ukraine was lucky not to be such a country, country in transition, but we got our independence without blood, without great fight, for free. And now we are paying this price. Uh, and uh, IWPR appeared in Ukraine in late 2014 after Euromaidan protests, after uh, Crimea annexation by Russia, and after the warfare uh, in Donbass. Traditionally, IWPR works with security issues for journalists and bloggers, and uh, we did a series of uh, training workshops on security, digital, and uh, physical and conflict reporting for Ukrainian journalists and Russian journalists who visit Ukrainian conflict areas. Uh, so, uh, we had a Crimean project. Uh, it was done for uh, the organizations which had to move from Crimea, but uh, still have uh, their undercover reporters within, within, within occupied Crimea. And it was also security, and also we funded uh, uh, underreported Crimean issues. Uh, funded coverage by these organizations, by media organizations and uh, civil society organizations. Uh, but to date, uh, IWPR uh, has been generously funded in Ukraine by the US government, by the Dutch government and Norwegian government. Uh, so first part of the project uh, uh, funded by the government of uh, 
the Netherlands uh, was dedicated to security uh, trainings, and the second part, which is current, uh, is connected with anti-corruption. Uh, we are working uh, because the resources are limited. We focus our resources uh, in four regions of Ukraine and try to establish and make functional uh, the teams of uh, activists, along with media, with journalists, along with lawyers and sometimes with reliable politicians uh, to combine their efforts on fighting corruption, how they can do it. Uh, we came to regional level because uh, at the national level there are a lot of strong national organizations and uh, they are really powerful like Transparency International Ukraine, the chapter of the International Transparency. And uh, reanimation package of reform, this is a coalition of numerous organizations, etc. And most of these uh, uh, activists and people, they appeared, they uh, started to do something after the revolution of dignity. And actually, a lot of reforms in Ukraine are made due to the pressure from the civil society and from the international organizations who uh, can participate directly in these reforms with their experts, with their direct aid and uh, funding by funding of the civil society organizations in Ukraine. Uh, so uh, corruption in Ukraine is well known uh, problem and uh, seriously if we talk about the difference after the revolution of dignity in 2014, uh, it's just a small period, just three years uh, to, to show how it is uh, counted differently from previous periods. Uh, there are uh, various novelties in our legislation and various new tools for civil society which people can use and which people, uh, activists and journalists, are uh, only training to use. Uh, first of all, we had tremendous opening of information to the public. Maybe, uh, if uh, to be uh, correct in statistics and compare all the achievements in this area, uh, maybe Ukraine can be even record-keeping country in this. Uh, uh, like 300 data sets uh, were made public. And uh, also in the uh, machine-readable format. So this is the great opportunity for data journalism and investigative journalism. Uh, except that not a lot of journalists can do uh, uh, use these uh, huge resources. Uh, uh, government introduced electronic declaration system that thousands of our governmental officials have to file all their properties and uh, then report to the society about the sources. Uh, electronic procurement system, the huge area for uh, various corruption schemes uh, like is now limited. Uh, these uh, steps are great uh, to some extent, they are not perfect because there are, again, various uh, drawbacks in laws that uh, our officials can skip everything. Uh, and um, uh, every day there is a small fight between the government and civil society when, uh, like, uh, someone in the parliament or in the government tries to put some laws which will uh, return the situation back, but then uh, organizations or civic protests uh, try to uh, stand for, uh, to keep these novelties and to keep the value of these reforming steps. Um, what about, what is the connection? I'm sorry, I forgot about my slides, but actually these are pictures. Uh, <laughs> and some word <laughs> disappeared. These are our accountability clusters. These are young people from uh, various anti-corruption headquarters, anti-corruption offices and centers which appeared in these four regions which I mentioned. These are geographically uh, north, uh, south, uh, east and west of Ukraine, Kyiv, Kharkiv, Odessa and Lviv. Uh, corruption. Uh, I told you about the, that we are making some steps and our government uh, resisted, of course. So they do reforms unbelievably. 
uh, but uh, this is due to the pressure of the civil society and the international partners. And actually, visa-free regime was also a motivation for the Ukrainian government to proceed with the reforms. And now there is a question whether what would be the next uh, uh, motivation for them when we got visa-free regime. Uh, corruption in relation to information war with Russia. Uh, this is one of the narrative of Russian propaganda that Ukraine is failed state. It's waste of money. It's like uh, hopeless and uh, corruption is the main barrier. Uh, to a certain extent, it's exaggeration because propaganda uses usually a lot of truthful facts and then a bit of uh, uh, fake. And uh, our progress in reforms would be one of the best uh, steps to counter Russian propaganda because uh, all uh, desire of Ukrainian people to come to Ukraine, uh, U European uh, Union values, to European Union living standards, they are interpreted by uh, Kremlin uh, narrative like uh, these are not desires of Ukrainian people. All reforms are inspired by Western countries and they usually uh, do not always bring positive changes because uh, sometimes pension age is increased and people are not happy. Or uh, after the revolution of dignity, people became poorer than they were before. Uh, relatively, uh, rate exchange rate of Ukrainian grivna uh, changed three times. But uh, I would like to say, as a patriot of Ukraine, that we are not hopeless and we are doing uh, really good progress towards this. Uh, IWPR will continue working in Ukraine, uh, contributing to democratic development uh, through media development, independent media development, and uh, making government accountable. And also, uh, we will continue with my colleagues uh, this discussion, but my message about uh, information was that Western societies may seem that Ukraine is somewhere far away, and war is somewhere far away, even for Kyiv citizens, it's far away. And, uh, but you should pay more attention to uh, this information efforts analyze uh, them in your level and do something about it, because it's dangerous. Thank you, Thank you Katja. That's that, that, that you ended with a very clear warning to our, on our address. Be aware. Um, um, one rule, your questions are more important than mine during this gathering. So if you have a question, if you have a remark, if you want to say something, please raise your hand. I'll be with you. Um, and so you'll be able to ask your question. So if you have any questions, raise your hand. Um, you mentioned um, uh, what Russia tries to do is to paint a picture of Ukraine as a failed state. Right? Uh, and that's exactly what we have to sort of um, uh, it's, it is not a failed state. You became angry. We were discussing it just uh, over dinner. It's not, we are not a failed state, you said. Huh? We are not a failed state. Not at all. Things are going in the right direction. Can you give us some proof of that? Because it's far away for us, and we perceive Ukraine also to some extent as quite corrupted. Uh, first of all, it's uh, very hard to uh, fight corruption overnight in any country of the world. And I think that it must be systematic efforts which uh, partly depend on political will uh, and uh, it more uh, depend on systematic uh, changes in the legislation when uh, such changes can be irreversible. I think that first step is uh, access to information. Mm -hmm. uh, many spheres of uh, you, uh, public life and economic life and uh, various governmental areas became more transparent. And just uh, society is not used to have such an access and uh, neither society nor professionals uh, do not know, or know what to do with such huge massive of information. So I think that it's just gradual process. Takes and time, and yeah. look, uh, we were very much inspired after the revolution of dignity, that now finally we get rid of uh, Yanukovych and his uh, allies, and at last we will start working on ourselves for reforms. But then war aggravates the situation tremendously. The, the real warfare 
Okay. You mentioned uh, reliable politicians, journalists, lawyers, they work together fighting corruption. How dangerous is it actually to fight corruption as a journalist in Ukraine? It's uh, not so dangerous. It's, uh, uh, you know, our journalists try to prove that th this is not only one person who fights corruption or investigates corruption. Uh, it's like uh, if this one will be prevented or even killed, mm -hmm. there will be his colleagues who will continue this. Mm -hmm. And this is the idea which is shared by many. So it's not easy. I think that the most um, uh, well-known uh, murders of journalists in Ukraine, like uh, Gangadze, like Pavlo Sheremet, mm -hmm. uh, they were not direct, like this journalist knows something, we need to kill him. Mm -hmm. It was more provocative and uh, it, it was using these figures. But uh, in terms of uh, many other journalists, I would say that network of investigative journalists amounts to 150 people in Ukraine. And these are groups and uh, regional centers appear every year. And these are groups of three, five first uh, people and they continue, uh, they, like, uh, inside, uh, they like inside each other. Okay. Okay. Final question. Um, the best way to fight Russia's fake news, trying to destabilize, uh, to create this picture of a failed state. The best way to fight Russia is to create a prosperous Ukraine. Yes, correct. <laughs> your but it share, takes share, time. Share, share with us your fantasy. You live there. How far away is the Ukraine from being prosperous and being strong, being able to fight off this Russian destabilizing I think that uh, we live in an unpredictable world in all senses, in terms of technologies, etc. That's why I would not give any forecasts in terms of, of years you have a and, and. But uh, yeah, come on, share this fantasy, <laughs> paint a rosy picture. But I'm not. What's possible? I'm not living Ukraine, so I believe that it will happen during my life. Yeah. Hopefully, and uh, also uh, we are firm in doing this. We are firm. Many Ukrainians are firm in, uh, in believing that we are making progress. Thank you very much. Can I have a big hand? Katja Lava. Our, our IWPR director, managing director in, um, um, for the Ukraine. Because that's why I'm here, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My role, um, I'm an investigative journalist, but also part of the advisory board, um, uh, Derek mentioned. And I strongly believe in the work of IW, IWPR and the importance of the work of IWPR. Soft power, fake news and propaganda from Russia. A month ago, I was moderating a similar session with one difference. It was more or less the same title, but a strong focus on the impact of alternative facts. Remember alternative facts? And the American president in this case, the American president Donald Trump, telling the world that journalists are not to be trusted and an enemy for his government. Now, in the Netherlands, we tend to act like, both talking about Putin and his ways or Trump and his ways, we tend to act like we would never do such thing. What a strange world we live in. But let's not kid ourselves. The powerful elite in this country does exactly the same. Trying to use the media to get their message across, even fake news. For example, today. I had to mention it because it crossed in, in the news today. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's almost funny, but it's a fact. Huh? Have you found out the fake news in this? Okay, I'll tell the story. Okay. Um, the police in Groningen, the police in Groningen admitted sending a fake, fake message to Het Dagblad van het Noor, which is a Dutch newspaper, and up in the north, the only newspaper left in Groningen. Anyway, uh, so they admitted sending a fake message to Dagblad van het Noorden containing the message was, the rape is solved. A certain rape, it is solved. Um, and they were hoping that the guy which was suspected from this specific rape, terrible of course, but it would read it and then decide to turn himself in. It's true, it's true. So he did not, by the way. He, yeah, so he did not turn himself uh, in. And now, and now, this is really happening, it's true. Eh? The editor-in-chief uh, of the Dagbad uh, uh, van het Noorden complains, of course. He feels that he cannot trust the authorities anymore. But the prosecutor again explained, and this is what I'm trying to get across, this is the way we work. Eh? The prosecutor, police, this is the way we work in the Netherlands. We use, and I've never heard it before, this one, so keep it in the back of your minds, we use creating noise strategy. It's called noise strategy in order to be able to catch the perpetrator to organize law and order. 
<laughs> For me, it's completely new, but this is a fact now. We have fake news in the Netherlands as well. So I think that Putin, Trump, to some extent, they think more or less along the same lines. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have 75 minutes. We started a bit late, so are you okay? That will end around quarter past 10. Is that fine with you? Okay, so we have 75 minutes left. What we will do is we have four passionate speakers after Katja, four more passionate speakers. Um, they will all stick to a message and, and try to get it across in 10 minutes, and then the floor is yours. So we'll have five, six, seven, eight minutes or so to discuss with you. What, so it's very important to make it interactive. So um, prepare your questions. Uh, and we'll finish around quarter past 10 with drinks. That's important too, with drinks, because we will be able then, we will, in the end, with drinks, we will be able to solve all the issues raised. Huh? Quarter past ten. So, let's go at work. Sorry? Sorry? Yeah, that would be nice, the police of Groningen, to have them here. Well, maybe next time. Um, but it's interesting. Um, okay. First, uh, the next speaker. We will stick to the Ukraine, by the way, and the way Russia is trying to destabilize the Ukrainian government, tries to make it look like a failed state, as was uh, clearly explained by Katya. Uh, not successfully connecting to Western Europe, etc. Okay, she spent almost 15 years in the media industry, in recent years focusing on propaganda, fake news, the weaponization of media and its direct influence on democratic processes and institutions, as well as phenomena as both truth and post-truth societies. She's co-founder and editor of fact-checking website stopfake.org. Check it out, it's, it's fun. We'll discuss it later. It's, it's a funny way to talk about fake news. Uh, so she's co-founder and editor of fact-checking website stopfake.org, producer and anchor of its weekly TV show, news TV show, Stop Fake News. Stop Fake News. Can I have a big hand? Margot Contar. Okay. I will... I'm sorry, I need to just fact-check right away. My surname is Gontar. I'm, I'm sorry, Gontar, yeah, but, but everything else is true, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm still a co-founder. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to be, it looks like Oscars now, but uh, I'm honored to be here. I continue a bit of Katya uh, mentioning of uh, honor to, to be able to speak here on behalf of my country, but actually my presence here is kind of a, a, a joyful and a sad moment at the same time. Because joyful, because every time I, I got to speak, it means that Ukraine has a live voice and you need to uh, stick with me for 10 minutes, so it means that you will know about Ukraine a bit more. But the sad point, it means that it's not longer a temporary issue we thought it might be in the beginning. And it's no longer a Ukrainian issue, because now I'm speaking about this in the Netherlands. And what basically we do at Stop Fake Org, uh, we, fact, we, we check the facts and we basically refute the untrue information. And we do it for three years. And we refuted more than 1,000 fake stories about Ukraine. And basically what fake stories about Ukraine will be. So it will be like Kaida mentioned stories which try to show that Ukraine is a failed state, that government cannot do basically anything, that there are people rioting on the streets and doing protests which never happened or happened, but the organizer was where, surprise, surprise, Russians or pro-Russian organizations, pro-Kremlin organizations, I'm sorry. And, or, for example, my favorite stories I like about um, Ukrainian militaries having a plague you know, plague is, right, this, this medieval disease, which never happened. Or, for example, people stealing bread from pigeons because there is a famine in Ukraine, which never happened. So it's just a fake story circulating. And we try to stop them. We are now in 10 languages, Dutch included, by the way, so you can check it. Uh, and English, obviously. And we have a show, as, as was mentioned, Stop Fake News. And... Uh, but the thing is that what we've been told so often, that this all is about reacting. So basically the fake stories are there, and so we're just reacting, and the fake stories again appear. And what we had a discussion previously in the, in the hall, that, that people might be 
suspecting the very idea of fake news. I mean, because what is fake news? Who decides what fake news is about? And okay, if we deal with a fake story, I mean, someone that says that this happened and they have no proof, no evidences. So this might be easy, you just found the evidence and show it. But the thing about the Kremlin propaganda and the propaganda itself as it works, it's not just only fake news, it's also manipulation. It's just twisting the context. It's also, you can say in a way, cultural expansion. So this is also the problem we deal with. And the main, the main question for us is now in Ukraine, and the question what I hear from my colleagues, what is so appealing about fake news? What is so appealing about this twisted or manipulated information? And um, as, um, as to compare in Ukraine, when the fake news are about the failed state, in Europe and other countries, it works in other ways, so it's not so obvious. In other countries, it works like anti-migrational stories, like xenophobia stories, like stories that are anti-EU, and they might not seem like a fake story or manipulated, they might seem like just... Um, conspiracy theory story, but still someone might believe it. But the thing is, what is so appealing about this is because it's like populism giving easy answers uh, to the questions which might not have easy answers at all. So basically, like, who steals the jobs? Immigrants. But actually, technology is what's stealing the jobs. There are these uh, statistics and numbers, like, for example, that three million of jobs, uh, three million of drivers of trucks in USA will lose their jobs once the technology will be up and there will, no need, will be no need for a driver at all. But this is not immigrant thing. This is about technology and also about self-education. Uh, and this is what, one of the things that we actually think that might help. But I think we, we will talk about education and self-education a bit later. And um, that's why um, I'm, I'm more likely in talking not only about issues, but also about the thing that can be solved, like, the way that can help us solve this. So basically also what is so appealing about fake news and manipulative uh, stories we can see not only for Kremlin media, but also foreign media use this as well. This is how exciting they are and how appealing they are in terms of produ produ producing, right? In terms of production. So they are produced well. And this brings us a bit to term infotainment which is like combination of entertainment and information because basic I'd say old school journalism is about this neutral position and about providing facts so the audience can decide for themselves. But what this um, media who use fake news or manipulative, what they are about, they are about giving the show and twisting information. But uh, the, one of the things we actually came to is that it's better to, you know, like Steve Jobs saying about stealing, so basically to steal this thing and to make maybe more fun of news that they were previously before. So basically to, to um, make truth sexy again, like Justin Timberlake could have seen it. So uh, to make it more catchy. And this is actually an arguable moment because some of my colleagues say, no, 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 you should be perfectly neutral like in everything you do. But the thing is that there may be people who are not like why people will listen to your neutral story when they are outlets out there who will, you know, feed you up with all these colorful things. And that, that there will be only the second question whether they are true or not. So in this contest of um, media, which is changing now, and basically old school media outlets coming down while social network is coming up with all this less and less time for people to actually get in and with the, with the, chance to share the story just with one click. So this is a huge contest you are in. And so we need, as a journalist, need to be more, I think, um, creative in this. And um, so, um, so finishing basically this, um, should I talk about education now or later? So should I talk about education now or later? So um, what we also came to is that 
what can save us as journalists is, yes, uh, refuting the untrue information, yes, becoming more creative, and also media literacy and self-education and education uh, starting from schools. Because the thing about tolerable society we are in, uh, there is only one way to actually stay this way uh, longer, is that everyone in our society will be aware of what information is about because is this is like about this is like from fight club and tyler Durden, who was saying that you know that you think you own things but you end up with things holding you with the information is the same thing because i think a lot of people think that they understand what information is about but we end up information manipulating us because what is this about this is just a war for hearts and minds of people. And so the only way to defend ourselves is to teach everyone to defend themselves. And this is, means to teach everyone logics, to teach everyone the basics of what media is about, what journalism is about, that any information is a true information only when there are evidences, when there are basics for this, and that everyone can check it. So this is a very, uh, because Media now is a weapon. Basically, this is a concept of <laughs> sorry weaponization of media, right? And um, that is why we need to understand this, and we need to defend ourselves against the weapon we are battling with. Thank you. Thank you. Michael, go to me. Stay, 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 stay. Okay. Please stay, stay, uh, stay on, on, on stage. Beautifully, beautifully said, it's a war to win hearts and minds of people. Uh, first, uh, I said it before, but I want to repeat it. Go, go and check this site out because it's, it's an uplifting site. Uplifting. It, uh, yeah, it is uplifting. And it's, it's, of course, it's a very serious topic. <laughs> but the way you treat fake news, I'll, I'll give an example. Uh, you were mentioning, uh, Katja, the uh, visa, the new visa-free uh, arrangement with the European uh, Parliament, which the European Parliament decided on today. There was a, a, a TV show in Russia, and it was discussed on your fake, uh, on your yeah. Yeah, your side. Yeah, yeah. And in this Russian TV show, it was explained to the, to the Russian audience, of course, they get visa now in the Ukraine, but what they don't understand is that these visa are only meant for Ukraine prostitutes. Seriously, the only Ukrainians which are welcome in Europe are the prostitutes. And radicals. Yeah? I think they're also and radicals. And the bodyguards too? Okay. Radicals. Oh, the radicals. Oh, okay. <laughs> prostitutes and radicals. Anyway, that was the message show, and it was a big, big TV show. It's a big Russian TV show. Yeah, I think show. it was TV Zvizdano. Yes, and how did you react on how, and the, what I found out is that the way you react upon it is like, these incredible Russians, don't they understand the first thing? Huh? It's, a, it's kind of, so not really angry, but more making fun. The presenter was sort of making fun out of the show. Yeah, my, my, my favorite thing is we try to like, okay, but we can explain. Like, we, we understand that you have lack of time, and you kind of didn't understand it well, but we can explain this work, this and this. We actually started being neutral. The first shows we had, the first stories we had, we wanted to stick to this old, cool, balanced thing. But then it appeared that it, to win the, Again, to win the audience, which has been stolen by, by, by all the shows and which are used to this kind of present, presenting of content. So, so you, need to, you need to stick to this and not, maybe not to fall down to, to, to the very low way they're doing this. You know, with, they have actually soundtracks. Mm -hmm. They have this dramatic soundtrack as effects, like in Lord of mm -hmm. the Rings, and they like, go in with a low voice, like, and the boy stars did it for the first time. Really, this is, this is exciting, and this is a problem. I personally watched the movie about Putin, I think, and it was filled with the twisted little details. But on the seventh second, I was like, oh, he's a great guy. Look, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. This so <laughs> this is, yeah, this is, this is how it works. So you, even, even with all the knowledge, you got kind of caught in, in the details. One more, one more point. So raise your hand if you have a question, please. Uh, again, yes. You are. Uh, Dennis Meyer, who is the audience for this field? fake uh, news? On which audience do they, is it the Ukrainian people or is it the Russian people or? It's in 10 languages, huh? I'm sorry, I, I will... I, I who is the audience of... Of, of, uh, of, of fake news or uh, of our website? The, the fake, fake news. Or the website or the fake news? Fake news. Mr. Wolfsperre. Gerrit-Jan Wolfsperre. My question is... Uh, what puzzles me is how do you reach the people in the street? And, oh, this uh, is... You talked about the media. When right. you look at the traditional media like newspapers and TV stations, 
Is there a distinction between those media who try to be objective, try to be fact-checking, and other media who are more or less the, for the speakers of the government or even Russian-orientated? So, so what is the audience? How do you or how do you reach out to what audience? Right. So. Uh, Thank you, Derek, for help. So this is about traditional things. We're not only a website, we're also having a newspaper. Sorry. Newspaper in Russian. So this is not for, like, this is only one hundred. And what does it mean to for, uh, for you're right, bravo? Your right to know. Your so, right to know. So the title of the newspaper is Your Right to Know. So this is only 100,000 copies, and this is only for, uh, for, yes, this is only, well, we have, well, we have uh, millions in Ukraine, for example, and we have even more millions of Russian-speaking population. But, uh, uh, but this one is for uh, uh, people uh, so the occupied site, the territories. Site is mainly focused on people in Ukraine. Uh, no, no, no. The site focused on um, language-speaking. Uh, first of all, language-speaking people are uh, not only in Ukraine. So basically, in Russia, in Ukraine, and whatsoever where Russian-speaking population might be, because Russian-speaking uh, people are the main uh, consumer of Russian state channels and whatever the Russian uh, Russian language content, which is the main, uh, I say, the main danger of spreading fake news stories. But this is why we have also nine other languages, because uh, uh, the fake stories are not only spread in these languages. So basically, our audience also is now in other languages such as English, English, uh, Spanish, Italian, French, and Dutch included, and, and others. How big is the impact of the site? How many visitors do you have? Well, the, it depends on the day and, yeah. and whatsoever. So it was like 50,000, it was sometimes like 150,000 per day per month. But uh, okay. we have uh, up, almost up to 2,000, 200,000 followers in all over social network. And uh, like Facebook is now like 50,000, for example, a Russian one. But we have growing audience in, the, in, in different other languages. I understand your question. Your question is actually about the regular media and others. Right. Oh, this is an uh, d d additional question. I got it. So, um, well, I'd say they there are, but uh, there are questions to some of them still. But since we have a lot of newspapers which are not controlled by one center, so that means that we have, like, even even when. Uh, even when you have doubts, you can check in other sources. But there are reliable uh, traditional sources of information, yes. Okay. But uh, 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 answering your question, who are the audience of fake news? So who are consumers, right? So who, who are targeted? So I, I think Artemi will actually uh, speak on that even more later. But uh, uh, from what we see, again, the consumers are the Russian-speaking population. But as Kremlin propaganda works, they, they are doing it for this is in internal propaganda, so for their own citizens, and also external propaganda for, for the others. It might be sometimes a bit different, it's in different languages. But we try to battle the, 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 the one which is for Russian-speaking population. That's clear. Thank you. One more also. question. Yes. Lucette Wagenaar. Um, I'm wondering if you focus on young people as well, because I learned that especially young people told me that their parents are still listening to Russian television and so on, and they have difficulty in accepting there's a new reality, there are new media forms. Do you focus on young people, or do you try to reach also to the older people? Thank you. This is, this is a great question. I, I think it's the first time I've been asked about concretely this. Uh, so we are... Uh, well, um, I think we are not exactly having this uh, kind of distinction between younger and older generations. So we basically provide information for those who might be interested in Ukraine and uh, might have a bit of knowledge about this, but we try to give the background. But this is definitely an issue, what you mentioned about this gap and the, the very fact that Russian televisions can, still can be reached in Ukraine. And uh, this is the very fact why we are there. We are, cannot, we are still not on the same Russian television where fakes are provided, but we are hoping that the very fact that we are an archive kind of thing, so we have this accumulating effect. And so 
people can share it and maybe come back to us and check it for ourselves. As for Ukraine, we are also on different channels uh, the, in Kiev and in the regions. And we know that uh, different other in Russia as well, uh, maybe besides taking our video and, and, and sharing it as well. Thank you. Can I have a hand from Margot? Margot. Thank you. Kuntar. He is a Russian activist, cultural critic, university lecturer and journalist. In the 80s, he played a significant role in the anti-Soviet cultural revolution of the Soviet youth. He is author of Back in the USSR, True Story of Rock in Russia, um, and Tusovka. Tusovka, is it pronounced well? Who's who in the new Soviet rock culture? He fled Russia because of his critical voice and he lives in Estonia. Now can I have a big hand for Artemy Troitsky. No rock and roll this time. I'll focus on the issues of the Kremlin propaganda. And indeed, fake news is not a Russian invention. This is a global disaster. Uh, but uh, there is some Russian specifics in it. Uh, the problem is that uh, in Russia, unlike <laughs> in the West where fake news is rather marginalized and, it, and are used by mostly outsiders, far left, far right, or simply really weird like uh, Trump. Uh, in Russia, fake news is fully supported by the state, fully supported by the authorities, and is very generously sponsored by them. So this is, this is not some kind of outsider activity. This is right, right to the uh, mainstream of the Russian policy. Another big difference is that uh, in Western countries, uh, it's easy to uh, r refute and to expose fake news because you have a, a plenty of quality media, TV channels, quality newspapers, and so on. So along with uh, The Sun and Daily Mail, you have The Times, Telegraph, The Guardian, and so on, and I'm sure the same, uh, the same in Holland. So uh, I have a suspicion that the uh, action of uh, of the Groningen police uh, will will be will be uh, exposed tomorrow uh, in the Dutch newspapers. In Russia, this is not happening, unfortunately, because uh, because there's too few honest media in Russia, and they're preoccupied with their own agenda, not uh, you know not fighting uh, fake news. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so we are in a difficult situation. Uh, what are the aims of uh, fake news? Uh, I think the four main ones are the following. Number one is to create uh, the image of Russia as a very well-managed, prosperous country with a raising economy, with great cultural life, and so on. At, at the same time, uh, portraying uh, Russian opposition as a gang of uh, foreign agents and bandits. Aim number two is, uh, again, is creating the image of the opponents of Russia from the United States to Ukraine as uh, fascists, uh, freaks, like uh, Europeans are all gays and freaks, as you know, uh, then, uh, or simply global maniacs uh, or globalist, 
globalist maniacs like the United States who want to rule the world and who would put Russia to its knees and destroy it. Same number two. Eight number three is to promote uh, the concept of so-called Ruski Mir, Russian world, which is a very vague concept of, of being a Russian, of, of Russianness, of, uh, of uh, uh, Russian prevailing in the various fields of human activities and so on. And first of all, uh, to promote uh, the Russian spirituality and moral values who, uh, which uh, prevail upon decadent Western values. Now, the fourth aim is uh, the maintaining of the cult of personality of Mr. Putin himself. Then, of course, there are several other aims as well, but like one of them which, uh, which you may face here in Holland is a promotion of uh, those Western politicians, usually right-wing politicians like Marine Le Pen, or Donald Trump, who are supposed to be Russian supporters. And this is a kind of aim that basically works uh, outside of Russia for, for foreign audiences. But uh, if we think about the impact of Russian propaganda outside of Russia, then of course here in Holland, uh, you may say in absolute frankness that, you know, it doesn't really mean much. Maybe some of you sometimes watch uh, a Russian English language TV channel called RT or Russia Today. As far as I know, uh, well, all the Western people, non-Russian speakers who I spoke about Russia today, they all told me, well, yeah, we sometimes see it in... Uh, watch it in hotels, and it's so funny, they're all absolutely freaky, they say weird things, so they don't take them seriously, basically. So I think that this part of Russian propaganda, uh, well, as Derek has suggested, it works well in the third world countries, I don't think it works well in the first world countries. But uh, there are different countries, even in the European Union, and uh, uh, the problematic part of the EU are the former Soviet republics, uh, the Baltic countries of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. In Estonia, the percentage of Russian population is 30, 30% 30 Russians. In Latvia, it's more than 40%. In Lithuania, uh, uh, about 15 And in these countries, uh, all this propaganda works really well, uh, which uh, gives us the following results. First of all, uh, the level of, of um, let's say, the Putinization of Russians in the Baltic countries is much higher than in Russia itself. This is quite amazing. But, uh, you know, when I come to Russia, and I still come to Russia very often, and I s speak with my compatriots about various issues, we sometimes argue. We can argue about the Crimea, we can argue about the personality of Putin and so on. I don't like him, they do like him. Uh, but then, we never argue about other things. We never argue about Russian economy. Everyone knows that it's in ruins. We never argue about Russian education. Everyone knows that it's awful. Never uh, argue about Russian health care, let alone corruption. Everyone agrees, yes, we do have all these problems. It's awful. Life is difficult. The quality of living is degrading and so on. In Estonia, when I speak to Estonian Russians, they all think that, that Russia is a promised land. They try to prove me that the average wage in Russia is 5,000 euros a month. In reality, it's more than 10 times lower, but they're sure about that. Uh, and of course, Putin is uh, God and, and all that, so it's quite scary. 
the second thing is that, again, Russians in the Baltic countries are very mistrustful of their governments, uh, very uh, uh, negative uh, about uh, the European Union, and uh, this, of course, uh, gives, uh, gives Russia a good chances uh, for, uh, you know, taking them as, uh, as the fifth column. And in, in, in 2014, uh, when uh, there were real fears of Russia invading the Baltic countries after the Ukraine, it was, uh, it was, really, it was really the issue. And I remember speaking to a Russian taxi driver once, and I asked him, well, he immediately started uh, to uh, say nasty things about Estonia and Europe and so on, and I asked him uh, my standard question. If, if, if you don't like it here so much, why don't you go to Russia, which you, which you love so much and, and think what a great country it is with uh, millions of opportunities. And usually, usually Estonians just shut up. They, they, don't, they don't say anything. But this guy, he told me, well, I'm here because I'm waiting for a signal from, from the Kremlin, from Moscow, and then we'll go and beat Estonians. You see, and this is, this is the attitude. Now, uh, another result of, uh, of propaganda is that Russians take extreme right xenophobic positions in, in, uh, in international issues. I mean, if you want uh, to know who is the worst enemy of, uh, of the refugees, migrants, blacks, uh, Muslims, and so on, then it, it will be the members of, uh, of the Russian community, both in Estonia and in Germany. And, and you know the famous story of, of a girl named Lisa uh, in Germany, so it's a good example, good example uh, of that. And, and then finally, it's, the result is uh, uh, civil passivi uh, passivity of, of, of a great part of uh, overwhelming part of Russian population. They, they don't really participate in the social life of their countries. They don't go to vote. They, they don't participate, or very few of them participate in the cultural life. They live in a very closed community, uh, and their best friend is, is Russian television. So these are uh, the appalling uh, results of, of the Russian propaganda in the Baltics. I'm finished. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes, back to me. This is, this is disturbing. Uh, one question from my side, um, if, if you allow me. So you mentioned in, in Estonia, 30% is Russian. Yes. A Russian background, at least. But 70% is not. Yes. What is it they do about this? I mean, is there a, is there a, a stop fake dot org? In, in, yes, in, in yes. Well, it's a very good question. First, Estonians, well, native Estonians, they don't consume uh, Russian TV and they have full immunity to Russian propaganda. They, uh, in Estonia, they have several good quality newspapers which give objective pictures of yeah. what is going on. Uh, the attitude of the Estonians is... Well, I have mixed feelings about it, but, but the, main, the main attitude is just to ignore it. Uh, I mean, both Estonia and Latvia are truly segregated countries. The, you, you know, it's like South Africa. There is white community and black community, and there's a tall fence between them. Uh, it's, it's almost the same in, in Estonia and Latvia. There are uh, Estonian... Uh, 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 media and, and Russian language completely media. Separated. Yeah. Mm? Completely separated. Yeah, completely separated. Estonian uh, stores, Estonian restaurants, Russian restaurants. Okay. So, uh, And uh, Estonians are pretending that there's no problem, although I personally think that there is a problem. You have a question. 
Um, hi, uh, my name is Galia Petrenko. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, well, you've been talking uh, about the situation in the Baltics, um, obviously with a huge Russian population living there, and uh, so there's, uh, Russian media has access to a big uh, audience there. You've been talking about the first world countries of Western Europe, where, well, Russia pro well, has some influence, but it's marginalized. What is your assessment of the countries that were, well, Eastern Europe, but it was part of the socialist uh, uh, bloc, but not part of the USSR itself. So Poland, Hungary, these, these okay. countries we see are mm -hmm. moving in a certain direction. Well, how do you assess it? Got it. Should I answer immediately or we'll wait for another yeah, question? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So I, I think that, uh, that the effectiveness of, of the Kremlin propaganda uh, depends on whether people speak Russian or not. And this is a very important issue, and I think that Dirk will, will tell you some interesting uh, observations about it. So in Poland, in Hungary, uh, in the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and so on, of course there is, there is a talk about Viktor Urban as being pro-Putinist uh, pro and the Polish government also being not pro-Putinist. Of course, they are anti-Putinist, but very right-wing, xenophobic, and so on. I think, I think all this depends on, on the local governments, not on Russian propaganda. I think that the impact of Russian propaganda in the former communist uh, countries is absolutely minimal. It's even less, it's even less than, uh, than in the... Uh, in the Western European countries because, because uh, well, in the Western European countries you have a lot of lefties. You have a lot of people, you know, who, who are used to trust the old Soviet Union, uh, who hate America, of course, and, and they don't have immunity for fake Russian news. In, uh, in Hungary or Poland or Czech Republic or Romania and so on, they, they know everything about communist propaganda so they don't trust it at all okay thank you one more question here uh, last question uh harry von bommel former member of parliament socialist party uh, i'd like to ask you the following <laughs> lfd <laughs> there's more of us here <laughs> <laughs> to what extent is fake news a new term for an old tool you also use the term propaganda but what about false flag let's go back to 2003 Let's go back to Colin Powell in the Security Council showing Ricene. Let's go back to Tony Blair proving that Iraq was able to attack the United Kingdom in 45 minutes. We started a war over that. The Dutch supported it. So to what extent is fake news a new term for an old tool? Well, I think, I think that fake news have existed for a long time. And, and I said in the very beginning that this is not a Russian invention, this is a global disaster right now. The new thing about fake news uh, first, uh, before uh, the, the fake news, they were used mostly for sensationalist issues. I mean, I remember reading British tabloids about German uh, World War II bomber found on the dark side of the moon and so on. Of course, this was... Uh, apparently fake news, uh, but, uh, but they were innocent fake news, uh, let's put it this way. Whereas, whereas right now, the fake news we're talking about, they're very well calculated political uh, lies. Uh, and, and I'm far from saying that, that they're only used by, by Russia. I said that they've been uh, used by right-wing politicians like Marine uh, Le Pen or during Brexit, a lot of fake news or rather fake figures were used by UKIP. And of course, we all remember stories about USA and Iraq. Uh, although I wouldn't call this fake news. Uh, I think that uh, George Bush Jr., he sincerely believed that there is a weapon of mass destruction. But at the end, uh, they appear to be fake news too. Thank you very much. Can I have a big hand? Artemy Troitsky. <laughs> he works for IWPR since 1994 after years as a reporter in Indochina and East Asia. 
He has conducted programs in the Balkans, the Caucasus, Central Asia, Afghanistan, Iran, and the Philippines. He was the media advisor for Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union at the Department of International Development in the UK. He frequently appears as a conflict and media analyst for BBC TV and Radio CNN, Channel 4 News, ABC, CBC, and, and Radio Netherlands is mentioned here as well. <laughs> Can I have a big hand? <laughs> That's, uh, Alan Davis. Hello, hello. First, uh, I would like to actually thank uh, Dirk and, and uh, the board uh, of RWPR Netherlands and Dido uh, and you all here for coming. Um, I've got four little short slides um, on um, the Balkans, but I wanted to pick up first a little bit on, on what some of the other speakers um, have, have been saying. Um, I'll start off with a little story um, about RT, RT uh, Russia Today, because um, I, I travel a lot. On, on Sunday, I'm going back to Vietnam. Um, and in Vietnam and in Burma, where I also work, um, you do get RT on, on the hotel channels. You do get also two Russian language stations on the TV stations in the hotel. And that's new. You know, last year in Vietnam, last year in Burma, you didn't get that, okay? But uh, I think um, RT, Russia Today, is uh, insidious, uh, and it is part of the problem. Um, and I think the, the, the Kremlin is spending a lot of money um, on it. Uh, and I had a discussion in the Foreign Office, the British Foreign Office, um, a couple of months ago, uh, saying very politely, you guys, the Foreign Office, you guys are quite late to this. I mean, I'm a little bit concerned that when we start to talk about fake news or, 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 or Russia propaganda, it's actually too late. By the time we actually notice it, it's too late, and it's very difficult to change things. I mean, I, I covered the war in Yugoslavia in 1991 in a place called Vukovar, and I came back to England to say, Christ, Yugoslavia is going to explode, uh, uh, and, and it wasn't really covered properly until Bosnia in 1992, by which time it's probably too late. And I get a sense, I don't want to be pessimistic, but I get a sense that Russia has six years on us. Um, and so I was saying to the Foreign Office, you guys have got to get your act together. And I said, look at what Russia Today is doing. Uh, and the Foreign Office said, Russia Today is not important. Nobody takes Russia Today seriously. But I pointed out that actually Russia Today I don't know if you remember, a couple of years ago, uh, there was a vote uh, in Scotland for partition. And the Scottish National Party um, lost by five or six percent. Russia Today did a story. Russia Today has an office in um, London, also in Edinburgh. They did a story basically that the election was stolen from the Scottish National Party because the pro-English, the bloody Brits, they, they stuffed the ballot boxes. And that story by Russia Today was then picked up by the Independent. And the Independent made a story. And so that story got validity, validity, um, because of the Independent. So that's, you know, that, that's crafty, that's clever. So that's, uh, uh, you know, Russia Today insidious. So I think it is, it, it is a problem. Okay, um, I, I want to talk about Russia um, in the Baltics. In the Baltics, in the Balkans, can I, can I do this thing? No? Oh, here we are. But before I do, I want to kind of emphasize that I think we should talk about, we, we should separate Putin and the Kremlin from Russia, okay? Just as we should separate um, Trump from America, okay? We're talking here, if I say Russia, I mean the Kremlin uh, and Putin. Um, and I remember um, working for DFID in, in the 90s um, and going to, to Moscow um, and working on media development. Um, and um, everything was, seemed to be great. Um, and and DFID was, was investing a lot of money in media development in, in Russia. But then it came about that Putin got elected and somebody in number 10, basically, I won't mention his name, but he's a quite senior journalist in the FT. He said to Tony Blair in 1999, Putin's a good guy. We don't need to worry about him. So DFID stopped all its funding and basically said, uh, Russia, Ukraine, we don't need to worry about it. And that, that was obviously a big, a big mistake. Okay. 
so I simply want to talk then about, you know, why is um, Russia, what, what is Russia trying to do um, in the Balkans? And here, I think number three is, is pretty important. You know, why is, is, is Russia doing what it's allegedly doing in, in the Baltics? Why is it basically active in the Balkans? Uh, why is it doing via, via RT? Uh, why is it um, doing its stuff in, with the Scottish National Party? And I think basically, it's just my belief, it's acting as a disruptive power. Maybe it thinks it cannot basically stop the EU uh, enlargement process, but it can maybe disrupt it somehow. So that, I think that's important. Um, and I think also it, it, in, in the Balkans, it's rent-seeking, which, as you know, is basically uh, manipulating public policy for private gain. And I think people are starting to say in the Balkans, Russia is investing a lot of money in the, Bal in the Balkans, um, and a lot of money then goes back to Russia. Okay, so it's quite, it's quite clever. Um, and again, this is, this is my thinking, but it's, it's, it's my history A level or history O level. We always talked during history that Russia is always seeking a warm water port. Um, and the warm water port would be then uh, Montenegro. Okay. How does one change? Oh. So wh why the Balkans? Um, I guess the first answer is like, why not? Um, but obviously, it's cultural, historical links. That's important. And I think this also is, is important too. I remember when I used to work uh, a lot in Belgrade. Um, it was so important. Don't forget that Milosevic, the downfall of Milosevic, was actually the first, from the point of view of Moscow, it was the first color revolution. Yeah, we had, we had uh, um, Belgrade, then I think we had uh, the Rose Revolution, uh, Kyrgyzstan, we had Georgia, uh, and then obviously Russia thinks that the, 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 the attempted revolution or the revolution uh, in Kiev was the next one. And of course, we all know that uh, um, uh, Putin fingered Clinton, Hillary Clinton, for trying to create a new revolution, he said, um, in, in Moscow. And let's recall also, uh, a couple of years ago, um, you know, Russian interference in the Greek crisis, um, the funding, uh, you know, Golden Dawn. And also, we remember also a couple of years ago, uh, the Cypriot banking crisis, uh, very important. And now I think uh, if you go to Cyprus, it, it, it's very Russian Russianified. And of course, you know, this very strange story that hasn't been very well covered in the media, uh, the attempt to kill uh, Djukanovic, whatever. And, and, and a lot of these things happened. You know, when did they happen? Um, some people say like 2008. 2008 was um, the time when this became apparent. You look what happened in 2008 also. There was the, the financial crisis, um, 2007, 2008. Um, and also actually Kosovo uh, declared um, independence. Uh, and I think that pissed off uh, Putin. Excuse my French. So very quickly, um, no. very quickly, facts and figures. Um, there was a little meeting at the LSC, London School of Economics, on Friday, um, funded actually by, by NATO, but don't, don't, don't mention that. Um, that actually, yeah, that, that's part of the problem, I think. Um, that actually says a third of all registered companies in Montenegro are Russian. 7,000 Russian, 7, Russian residents, and of course, tourism. Bulgaria, as an example, 25% uh, come from Lukoil, which is uh, second only to uh, Exxon Mobil as the, uh, the biggest oil company in the world. In Serbia, very quickly, 10 media outlets and 14 pro-Russian media outlets. And this is just in Serbia also, alone, as an example. Okay? And the source is, in case you think I'm making it up, um, I probably am, uh, in, in case you think I'm making it up, is the Center for Euro-Atlantic Studies, uh, an organization based in Belgrade, um, funded by the Rockefeller Brothers, uh, and they published a study called Eyes Wide, Eyes Wide Shut, basically saying that you're blind to what is actually happening in, in, in Serbia. So all these things, um, just for Serbia, times that by five, six, and you've got the Balkans. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Alan. So, so what you're actually saying is that they're very successful in the Balkans. 
With which aim? How far? What does the fantasy of, of the Kremlin? You make clear distinction between the Russians yeah, yeah, and yeah, the Kremlin. That's yeah. very fair of you. Of My course. grandfather's Russian, so I've got to say that. Yeah. Oh, your grandfather's yeah. Russian. Okay, okay, okay. What's your ultimate goal then? I, well, again, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a generalist. My, my love is um, Indochina and um, North Korea and, and whatever. But um, so I'm a generalist. So I'm not no expert. Um, I bet just from working for Diffid, um, my sense is it's it's to uh, disrupt. Okay, I wouldn't say he's got a grand strategy, and a lot of people say he's a brilliant tactician. He's brilliant at actually do, getting the the best out of a bad hand, and obviously he's he's doing that. You know, oil prices going down, um, basically chaos. I think Artemis said this upstairs. Uh, chaos abroad builds strength at home. Chaos abroad builds strength at home. So, yeah, it's okay, clear. Thank you very much so far. It's already 10 to 10. We'll, we'll be back here together with you. Thank you. Alan, Alan Davis. Thank you. Um, one more short presentation, and he was already on stage in the beginning, welcoming, welcoming us, you and us. He started his journalistic career at the age of 18 as Belfast correspondent for a Dutch broadcasting company. It's a big smile on his face now, those good old days. And went on to produce documentaries for, from Vietnam, Iran, El Salvador, Lebanon, Afghanistan, Chile, and many, many other countries, before serving as editor of the Dutch magazine Nieuwe Revue. In 1989, he already mentioned himself, he went to Russia to build independent media to start Moscow Times. Russian editions of the Cosmopolitan. He was chairman of Vedomosti, the Russian business daily, published in cooperation with the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal. So in a way, we could say he helped Russia to build independent media. And now, 30 years later, he lives in a country that sort of needs the work of IWPR to make sure that independent media will survive. Can I have a big hand for Derek Sauer, keeping up his back upright in increasingly difficult circumstances. Um. Yeah, I'm a little bit a Russian in the room, um, and I want to say some uh, 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 soothing words. Not that I want to undercut the, the speeches of, of, of you know, my colleagues, um, but I, I, I also want to point out that, uh, yes, uh, Russia is trying to disrupt. Yes, they are heavily involved in fake news, but they are highly unsuccessful. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, the recent elections in, in France uh, have proved that, you know, what they've done in the United States has, of course, come back to them big time because, you know, now they have much bigger problems to deal with uh, than they had ever thought and that they ever would have with uh, uh, Hillary Clinton. But m much more important than that, uh, are the countries around the neighbors? Uh, you know, uh, there, there used to be the Russia space, Russia, CIS, Eastern Europe, um, and especially the CIS countries used to be very close culturally, politically, and were an extension of Russia. Um, and they all spoke Russian. It's very important, the, the language, because the language is the culture. Uh, creates the, the closeness. If you go now to Georgia, the new generation doesn't speak a word of Russian. If you go to Baku, the capital of Azerbaijan, new generation don't learn Russian anymore. If you go to Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan, which was the closest to Russia as you can imagine, uh, they just uh, uh, decided to introduce a Latin alphabet meaning the end of Russian, as we know it. Uh, uh, Ukraine is lost. You know, it, uh, the big majority of, of the Ukrainian population wants to be independent and wants to have nothing to do with Russia. Um, the Baltics, the same thing. Um, so they had a lot of friends, Russia. Uh, and actually it's very sad that now they have no friends at all. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so if you, st if you take a little step back, yes, we should fight uh, uh, the fake news. Yes, we should fight the propaganda. Uh, but Russia has a big talent to shoot itself in the foot. Um, and even Belarus, and Belarus is, is you know, 
is Russia, more or less. Even in Belarus, they don't want to have anything to do with Russia anymore. Um, so it means that, uh, uh, and it's Ellen already said, a brilliant tactician, but a lousy str str strategist. And I think that sums it a little bit up. And, but who is the biggest victim of, the, of all this? Um, this is, in my view, not the, the countries around, because they will find their way. They will uh, get a connection with the rest of the world. The biggest victim is the Russian people. Because what, what we should understand is that, you know, we talk about the Kremlin, we talk about Putin, we talk about the Russian as if that is one thing. But it is definitely not. There is a huge gap between the power and the people. Um, and they are, first of all, the biggest victim of the fake news. Because, you know, fake news is not something that is new and is exported to, to the rest of the world to advance Russia's goals. No, this is what is being used every day inside Russia uh, to make sure that uh, uh, the government keeps control over, over, over the people. And you know, this is just an example of, of what's going on now in Moscow, uh, which actually is a very nice city, and Russia is a beautiful country, so you know, don't get me wrong, I really love Russia, I love Moscow. Uh, the government has decided uh, to pull down uh, 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 almost uh, 5,000 blocks of housing where you have one million people living. Can you imagine that in Amsterdam they decide to to pull down uh, houses of one, uh, you know, uh, of uh, 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 yeah, whole of Amsterdam. I mean, can you? I mean, it's very, it, it's it's mean, also very Russian. The scale of these projects, anyway, it's a huge scale, and people just lose their house. And they don't know where they will end up. And with all the corruption going on, uh, 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 they fear the worst, and they have every reason to fear the worst. So this has led to a big, to a big protest movement, not from radical people, but just from ordinary people who live in those houses and are just scared for their future and for their house. Uh, well, they went, this weekend was a huge demonstration in Moscow for the first time. And that's, for Russians, it's something. Just for ordinary Russians, it's something. Yes, they get more and more support. But So what happens now is that thousands, the, the, the Moscow government has employed thousands of trolls, fake news, of people saying, it's a great idea, you know, I live in such an apartment, I'm so happy it's being torn down, I will get a free apartment, beautiful future, all these people who are protesting are crazy, and the social media are flooded with that, you know? So, uh, just to try to undermine this movement, this civil society movement that is now coming up. So, so the, the, I would say the biggest victims uh, and Achom also was very right to say, in the West, uh, you have an, at least the possibility to, uh, uh, to uh, 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 show what fake news is. In Russia, there are very few media, and I'm involved, as you may know, in one of those media who does that. Um, but, you know, you know that the life of journalists, we were talking about how dangerous it is in Ukraine. In Russia, it is dangerous. In Russia, journalists get killed on a very regular basis. In Russia, media get closed on a very regular basis. Uh, and, and the company that I work for is now under pressure because the owner, who's a well-known you know, businessman, but very liberal businessman, uh, is being forced to sell his business with the threat that otherwise he would lose all his money. Um, and, uh, and, you know, of course, they're trying to, you know, put the squeeze on every form of, of independent journalism. So, um, and that is why it's so important, of course, that we keep supporting uh, journalists, even if there are no official media left, uh, but uh, to support them through social networks, uh, through... Uh, 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 centers uh, where uh, journalists or civilian journalists can operate, 
um, because uh, you know uh, the, the the freedom of speech in Russia is more and more under pressure. Thank you, Derek. Well, we have to ask before we go and sit down here for discussing. We have student statements. Um, um, you're still there. I'm, 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 I'm repeating your own words. Right, right. Um, um, it is very dangerous to be a journalist. Uh, it's, it, media are being closed. Every, uh, why are you still there? Well, you know, I've become, after 30 years, I, I'm so tied to this country because I love the country. That's what, you know, that's what I'm always trying to say, make a distinction to, between the people in the country and, 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 and the city and uh, and and the, and the, and the power, you know. So and I try, you know. I work with a wonderful team of of great young journalists um, who who really try their best to you know to uh, do something decent. And I don't want to let them down. I, I, you know, it's easy for me to sit down and and, and live in Domburg, uh, which is a wonderful, beautiful place. Yeah. Uh, but how, but how, you have you have organized your own safety then? I don't have organized anything. No, no. I'm, I'm more of the school. You know, what happens happens. Okay, what happens happens. Please do sit down. There, Katja, Margot, Artum, Allen. Please sit down. We, we are going to. Um, this is one more microphone. Trying to discuss. We have 15, 15 minutes left for some discussion with the um, with the audience, and we prepared some statements. And, and you are, of course, obviously invited to. Um, uh, uh, to react on those. Can I have the first? Ah, very simple. We discussed it over dinner. Who in the audience, who is convinced? Uh, 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 Derek made very clear and also Artyom, uh, well, it's, it's, not, it's all more or less, uh, most fake news is oriented towards the Russians themselves, uh, to try to, to keep the Kremlin in place. Uh, but in the audience, where do you stand? Would you please raise your hand if you believe that Putin, in the end, wants to rule the world? Yeah, there's one, one, one very courageous young man <laughs> <laughs> raising his hand. You, you, you firmly believe this? Well, well wouldn't, wouldn't anyone like to rule the world? I mean... <laughs> Anybody wants to rule the world? <laughs> no, but, but do you believe that Putin has this aim of conquering the world? No, not necessarily. I mean, um, uh, perhaps parts of the world, yeah, that I would say definitely, but not the entire world, no, that would be a bit of an exit. You want to say something? I'm thinking maybe they used to, but maybe at the moment they want to maintain what they have now and the influence that they have on certain regions. Yeah, most of the audience is more or less convinced, Derek, what you said, also it's more focused on... He doesn't want to rule the world, but he wants to make it worse. He wants to make it worse? Yes, you know, we have a proverb in, in Russia, to go fishing in a dirty water. So the more dirty water Putin creates around Russia, you know, the more fish he will catch. See, well, okay. Well, I, I, I want to say one thing, if I, you know, uh, and also uh, reacting on what Harry, Harry just said. Uh, yes, of course, propaganda is not new. Uh, propaganda, you know, I remember when I came there 30 years ago, the, my first was an interview with Pravda, <laughs> because it was sort of you the know, truth. Dutch, a Dutch guy coming there, you know. So I gave an interview, it was all about, you know, media and, and, and press and this and that. Um, and then I read the interview, and the headline was, Derek Sauer loves tulips. I mean, literally. <laughs> we, we, uh, yeah, but, Fitz wants but, to know, was it? But, but, we, but the, word tulip, the, tulips was, the word tulips was not mentioned during the interview. And in the beginning, when in the Soviet days, the propaganda was to show how great Russia was. You know, so uh, uh, Brezhnev opening a new factory, Brezhnev, you know, the harvest, this and that. Everyone knew that it was all the numbers were inflated and a lot was nonsense. But it was all about how good we are. Now, it's exactly the opposite. If you watch Russian television now, it's only about how bad it is in the West. So, and in Ukraine. And, and, well, Ukraine. And Ukraine, so, yeah. so, <laughs> the, the failed how, state. How bad it is in the rest of the world with the underlying uh, uh, message 
how stable and how good it is in Russia. Yeah. And this is the, the core of the policy of Putin. Harry, Harry, Harry doesn't agree. Wait, wait, Harry, you get the microphone. <laughs> Isn't that going back to court war policy? That's exactly what happened during the court war. Everything was lousy at the other side of the wall. Well, that's exactly, exactly the same. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but uh, 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 yeah, but there was uh, Harry at the Cold War in the Soviet Union. There was still a very strong element of pride of what we have achieved: first men on the moon, engineering. Uh, cars, you know, this and now Russia doesn't have that because they don't have uh, their technology. They have completely lost it to the rest of the world. So there's very few things. So the only thing now is history. Why is Stalin coming back? Why, why, you know, why are they always talking about the war and so on? It's history because that is what they have achieved. And stealing of the Crimea. Well, and. <laughs> I have a question here from the audience, and then I will get to you. Well, it's it's more of a remark because I hear a lot of negative things about Russian media and all the propaganda. But I think Western media are just as propagandistic. I mean, the British state media, people call it British Brainwashing Corporation. It's just selective shopping out of the news, just like the Russians do, the Chinese, it's Al Jazeera. It's don't don't get me started on the BBC. I hate the BBC yeah, as much well, as you do, don't worry. But it's not only Russian media, it's, it's all media. Yeah but, there's a very, yeah, yeah, but there's a very fundamental difference. Very fundamental difference. You, I, I'm, I happen to be a big admirer of the BBC. Um, and, and we can both f say that and find that. In Russia, you cannot. That, that is a huge, huge difference. fundamental difference. In Russia, you cannot say, uh, I, I can, you cannot go on television and say, I don't like uh, uh, Putin, I don't like state television. Uh, Navalny, the most important opposition leader, cannot even come on, on television. That makes uh, the only channel he, he comes on is the channel that, that I'm involved in, um, the only national channel, and every time it happens, we have huge problems. Mago. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. We all want to hear what you have to say. We also have. I'll, I'll keep I mean, uh, Julian Assange is just a political prisoner. We have, we have these people in the West as well. But I, I want to jump in Margot. because what you do is basically the Kremlin. This is Kremlin discourse. You, that the, the West is as bad as we are. But this is, I, I, I support the direct position. This is not as bad. I mean, like, yes, there are problems everywhere. But you, the, the, the question is of a level of the problem. So the level is so much different yeah, yeah. that you cannot compare it. Yeah. And, but I'm, I'm, I'm getting back to the question of where yeah. we are heading. Putin wants to rule the world. I'm not exactly this optimistic my, my colleagues are. And because, uh, and what, I'm not exactly sure about the whole world, but it definitely is about the post-USSR countries because the fail of USSR was the worst event of 20th century, according to mm. what put Yeah, yeah, tragic, just titanic of 20th century. And uh, okay. yeah, and that's why all the countries are the basic possible victims. So this is a question of a pride, like Ukraine being successful, the, pressure, uh, the question of okay. a problem. And also what happens to Syria, this is, uh, that can show, can show what, that every Every country can become a Russian mir just just like this because I think you know that they have Russian language in schools now the second language in Syria in Syria okay. yeah this is one of the latest things so and Damask Nash is not just a thing I think this is not the thing Russians would think of before but now okay. Damask is ours is kind of a thing really happening okay. so next statement we worry too much about Russian propaganda fake news hmm. anybody agrees <laughs> Yeah, one, again, one courageous young man. Uh, yeah, you, 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 you are clear, yeah, in, in, in the panel. What do you, what do you think? We, we, we worry too much about Russian propaganda, we here in the West, in the Netherlands. We worry too much about uh, Russian propaganda slash fake news. I combined the two, uh, as uh, Harry already suggested. It is a difficult question. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, uh, well, I think... I think, I think that uh, for the time being, I think that you probably uh, worry too much about it, yes. 
I think, I think that there are some problems uh, which Europe is facing which are uh, more dramatic than the problem with Russia. But again, in strategic perspective, if you, if you let Russia do whatever it wants, well, again, not Russia, of course. I love Russia, too, and I'm Russian. Uh, you know what I mean. Uh, but uh, Russia can do as much as you can allow it mm -hmm. to do. I mean, if, if there was an adequate Western reaction towards what happened in Georgia in the year 2008, then there would be no Crimea and, and, and no Ukrainian war. But... Uh, uh, what should we have done that? Mm -hmm. What should have been the reaction to 2008? Well, I think uh, the reaction uh, to the aggression in, in Georgia should have been the same as uh, to the annexation of, of, of the Green. Crimea. Green. I think at exactly least the, the same. same. I mean, uh, you know, United sanctions. Nations sanctions. and everything, sanctions and so on. So and, and, then, and then it would be a, a good lesson for Mr. Putin. Alan. Uh, very quickly, I think, I don't think it's a bit because big exaggeration, but I think uh, Russian propaganda uh, delivered us uh, Trump. Uh, I think basically, okay, I'm not, again, I'm not a fan again, at all. You, you believe Russian propaganda delivered us Trump? Delivered us Trump. Again, I'm not a fan of uh, Clinton, but look back at what happened in terms of the leaks. And actually, I think uh, Julian Assange is very guilty of that. Julian Assange is a total puppet of, of, of the Kremlin, I believe. Um, okay. Yeah, but basically it was tipped. Um, and now we're all uh, That's a big so, story, Alan. But, yeah, <laughs> t t tell Hillary Clinton, I think she, she knows it. Um, it is, it is. But I think, you know, um, I think also, t t to be fair, uh, wasn't a big release of documents on Friday, the Friday before the, the French elections. And to their credit, um, the French media didn't, didn't, use did, any, yeah. didn't use any of it. They thought, bugger that, I'm not going to do that because this, yeah, yeah. We, we've been manipulated. They didn't do it. And okay. that could have flipped it for Le Pen. Derek. What they do is they, what, what they cleverly do is they put their finger on a sore point in our own society. They're very good at that. And we have a lot of problems in our own society that we don't deal with, you know. Um, so, but they don't create that problem. It's know? there and they <laughs> enlarge it. But they exploit They pinpoint it, it at uh, it. But they exploit it. But in the end, uh, and that creates a lot of problems, uh, but in the end, uh, uh, it's a uh, the, the street that uh, it's a dead end street okay. for the for for Putin. Russia is uh, uh, unfortunately has not used its uh, oil resources and its uh, all its wealth to build infrastructure. It's what we you know. Jim said infrastructure, health structure, uh, education structure, and so on. Um, and uh, the only thing they can do now is create trouble, and uh, by creating trouble, staying around the table. Okay. Can I? Is can I? Difference with the Soviet Union, if we had Radio Moscow in Dutch language, yeah. it was really propaganda how bad it was in Holland, how bad social we were. They had so much better social rules. We had Radio Moscow in, in Dutch. And also, it's also propaganda. Yeah, yeah but again, but it's because, know him, I, you, because I'm an old communist, yeah. so I listen to... Uh, yeah, me too. Are you, are, are, you, are you an old communist or a former communist? <laughs> uh, uh, against you, uh, against you, you have Radio Free Europe. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an old communist and I'm a socialist. <laughs> <laughs> And it was a support of the same party. Yeah, yeah, the microphone. Uh, take, take, the, take, take the microphone. Yeah. We don't agree on Ukraine. So, okay. Uh, I, I, I want to focus, because there's only this almost quarter past ten, I want to, and I want to go to the next point, because this, this, this is what we are here together, huh? um, IWPR. We should worry more about the critical state journalism is in. That's in Russia, here, everywhere, actually, huh? both in, in terms of earnings, uh, we all know that it's being disrupted, the media, everywhere journalism is being disrupted by technology, by the Facebooks and the Googles, and in trust, of course, uh, the, the, the media are not trusted anymore, in analysis, the same issue. Is, who, 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 do you agree with this statement? 
Is that, yes. yeah, most, most, most people. Do you? Do you agree? I do agree, yes. What, what could be done? What should be done? What should we do here, for example? I think nothing can be done. <laughs> I, I think it's the logical, uh, it's, uh, the, uh, the logical state of things. It's, it's a natural process, and the uh, Internet is to be blamed for that. You called it a disaster during dinner. Uh, probably, well, for old-fashioned journalists like me, it is a disaster. Uh, because, uh, well, I still love the old school, and, and I hate to write uh, short articles which only uh, uh, consist of headlines. So, uh, for me, it's an obvious thing, but on the other hand, I, I think that it's inevitable. Inevitable. Alan? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with this statement with Artemy. Uh, I think basically traditional media is in a point of collapse because there's, there's no... Point new, of collapse? In the point of, let's have this discussion in five years and see where we are in terms of traditional media. Uh, basically, there's no revenue anymore. Um, you know, I think basically somebody said that between Google and Facebook, they take 97% of all advertising revenue now. Uh, and I get the sense of without, without traditional media, traditional media um, established uh, a national dialogue in a state. Now you don't have traditional media doing that role, de okay. debate and dialogue. Uh, and so everything is okay. fragmented. So states are going to have trouble. Here's a gentleman who wants to make a remark. Goedemiddag, Simon Matthijssen. Um, I was rather surprised by the resilience and uh, the good work of uh, traditional media coming back after um, Trump. I heard that yeah. the uh, uh, American uh, newspapers got big rise in, uh, in uh, subscriptions. And uh, the first, one of the rules of Professor Timothy Snyder uh, about how to resist the populism uh, waving all over the world is invest yourself in good media by newspapers by newspapers that's the only way to get the truth in your door so well i, I have a little thank news. you the, the trump have bump a, are we talking uh, about the trump bump uh, yeah i have a little <laughs> news for you i just bought back the moscow times um, uh, <laughs> because because this is exactly what i what i totally agree uh, you know, we should in, keep investing in in independent media. And I'm I'm much less pessimistic. Uh, look, you know what now is happening with the New York Times. Look what is happening with the Washington Post. Uh, looks what's happening. Uh, some of the uh, media here uh, in Europe, they have are reinventing themselves. Are investing in good journalism, bringing great, uh, bringing great news. And of course, it's not on paper, it's mostly digital, but that doesn't matter because paper is, is just a tool, it's about the message. Um, so I'm, I'm less... I would like to add, uh, I've, I've been teaching journalism in Groningen for a couple of years, and if you talk to 22, 23-year-old journalists, they really have good ideas about the future of journalism. They're much more optimistic. And they, <laughs> you are 28, right? So you know what I'm talking about. And there's so much room for new sorts of journalism. It's all about finding the truth, but in different ways. So I, I really would like to be a little bit more optimistic. And, and I think there's a lot of work to do for IWPR. As promised, we would end quarter past 10. Um, I would like to have a big hand for Katja, Margot, Artum, Alan, and Dirk. Also, um, I like, would like to point you, uh, save the date, the 31st of May in the Bali in Amsterdam, or join us the 29th of May in the Humanity House in The Hague. Uh, we, we will tell you, as IWPR, uh, certain, as it is uh, pronounced there very clearly, Syrian stories. Exciting and, and also sad stories, but uh, the work of IWPR in Syria is extremely important. Difficult and important. Also, I would like to have a big hand for Dido organizing this evening. Very well done. And she was already worried because I, in, I said afterwards we're going to have drinks and she immediately she, she gave me a little paper and it said, be careful, we can only pay the drinks for the, for the guests invited because we are only, uh, so very clear you're invited for drinks, but you have to pay the for, uh, for yourselves. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much for joining. I hope it was fruitful. Thank you.